Hello, I'm Jonathan Bowman Perks and welcome back to my favourite time of the week. And I'm delighted to have Major General Sharon Nesmith with me. And she is the senior um, female officer in the British Army. She has commanded a uh, Army, British Army Brigade, uh, the First Signal Brigade, which is a very fine organisation. She's had a fascinating career um, from Northumberland. Uh, father was in the Royal Navy Reserve. Brother was also served uh, in the Army. She went to Edinburgh University and um, been in the Royal Signals, I believe, since 1992. Uh, served in the Balkans, Iraq and Latvia. And she's currently the Director of Personnel, which is a key role, and sits on the Army Board, as well as being Vice President of Army Football and Army Rugby. General, welcome. Lovely to have you on the series. Thank you for inviting me. So it's a real pleasure. And um, just give me a bit of a flavour of, of what you're doing at the moment um, in, your, in your current role. What does, it, what does it mean for people who are not in the military? What does um, the Director of Personnel mean? Uh, so the Director of Personnel for the Army means that I'm responsible for our serving population. Uh, I set out our personnel strategy mm -hmm. uh, and I'm responsible for enabling our people to be their very best through our terms of service and employment policies. Great. And what about, um, as, as you look back, just a little snapshot, some of the different roles that you had since you got commissioned as an officer. Just, just explain some of the different roles that you've done. Oh, yeah, so my regimental duty career, which is when I'm delivering operational um, capability, I um, have served and commanded up to formation level, as you have said. Um, my most recent role as commander of one signal brigade was um, part of a NATO uh, headquarters. So I was responsible for delivering uh, at readiness command support to both national contingency headquarters but also a NATO three-star um, headquarters uh, which was extremely rewarding and a really fabulous opportunity to lead some of our very best most talented um, soldiers uh, but I've also done then jobs outside of um, operational command roles uh, and a uh, majority of that has either been capability development or personnel, which is clearly what's led me to where I am today. And that's working at a strategic headquarters, largely in the Army headquarters. Yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. And of course, uh, it's so interesting at the moment with COVID-19 and everybody being in, in, albeit a loosened lockdown, lockdown, that communications is more important than ever, which has been, of course, your lifeblood in the Royal Corps of Signals. You know, you are the organization that has to ha help these headquarters and different elements of the army communicate with each other. And so technology becomes key. So you're actually in the heart of what's going to be the future of what we're doing. Um, any, any view you have on the, the challenges of being in communication and technology? Uh, well, so if ever there was a time that we need to innovate and deliver capability um, at pace, now is it to be able to um, allow our people access to continue sort of their learning and development linked to my personnel role but also just we're going to have to think differently about how we deliver our capability um, so ever more so was there a time where we needed to be innovative and to really grasp those opportunities uh, but actually i think as director of personnel it's very much a moment where we need to perhaps be thinking differently about our people yeah. um, i mean even pre-covid the very dynamic agile changing context within which we'll find ourselves operating means that we are looking for slightly different skill sets and talents in our people that perhaps we have in the past mm -hmm. uh, and i think from a personnel perspective that's what our strategy is all about delivering and is definitely my challenge of today about how we do that in the future uh, whilst keeping an eye on the today challenges yeah well the new normal is going to be so very interesting and and it's, it's nice that here we are, you know, we're doing a recording, you're in your home, I'm in my home, um, but you're in, in a very smart military uniform, I'm in my more casual t-shirt. But... Um, I can't well, actually see that I am wearing my slippers though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing I was just about to say, there's, there's the lovely touch of the humanity, because that's a great thing for me uh, about what makes inspiring uh, leaders, is their, is their sort of humanity. And you were saying to me, look, I've got two small, do you say boys, I think? Yes, two boys. What sort, of, what sort of age are they both? 12 and 13. 12 and 13. 
So they will be needing to use bandwidth and sort of, oh, yeah. like, so if we suddenly find that we'll realize that the boys, the just, boys are just the game, the gaming or doing their homework or whatever it is. But, but, but you and your, your husband Walker, you have to sort of balance all that. How do you find balancing both of you being busy? You know, your husband saved in the Remy, he now has got his own tree surgery business, but how do you balance the two of those when you're such a busy uh, army commander and, and, you know, he's doing his stuff? Uh, if, I, if I could bottle that, I suspect I would um, be a millionaire because um, I think uh, some days they, I think that's it, I've got it all in check, I've got it all balanced, I can, uh, I can do this. And then there's other days where I think, uh, I'm doing neither very well. Um, so I don't have the secret answer to it, uh, other than sometimes uh, I find I break it down into bite-sized chunks, what I can do today, tomorrow, either family life or work life. Uh, and that doesn't sound very strategic and it certainly doesn't sound very inspiring. Um, but from my perspective, sometimes that is the way to operate, yeah. uh, which allows me to balance the two. I think yeah. uh, at the end of the day, a part of it is about being kind to ourselves um, and not thinking that I can do everything all of the time. Yeah, I think that's that's. I need to say that to myself in the mirror a few more times, but I uh, actually, I think that's it. We we set very high standards for ourselves. Goodness, if we listen to our own heads and what's going on in there, there's, you wouldn't speak to anybody else that we speak the way we speak to ourselves sometimes when we're high performers. Mm. Okay, well, that's great. So let's go on to, to talk about, um, you know, the, the theme is inspirational leadership and particularly in challenging times, but it's just being an inspiring leader at other times. And what was lovely was various people said to me, the person we need to have on the recording is you, Sharon. It was um, Paul Nansen, the Commandant of Santos. Nick Pope said that, uh, Jim Richardson, a whole variety of people said, you know, she is a really inspiring leader and just very human, very normal. And that's what people want. They don't want somebody who's completely unapproachable and a bit of a dragon or a bit of a, a bully, if they, you know, a, a male. But who was it over time that has influenced you um, and, and been somewhat of a role model to you about they themselves were quite inspiring in the quiet way that they did things? I think you alluded to your parents. Do you want to perhaps, but they cannot be them. It probably starts with my parents. Um, well, it, I guess it probably starts with my, my upbringing because I would, I always say that I had a blissfully happy upbringing uh, where, you know, I had um, parents that uh, were always very supportive. I had a very happy family life. I went to the local school. Uh, I walked to school with my schoolmates. Um, we, you know, I, it was a very comfortable, happy time. Uh, but I think what I saw through my parents' eyes was that life is so often not about having a privilege, uh, but having an opportunity. Mm. Um, so they were very demonstrable in me personally, you can do whatever it is that you want to go and do. It's not about where you come from, it's not about your education, and it's not, certainly not about your gender. All of that, they just laid out a landscape that was full of opportunity um, and not so much about where it was about privilege. Mm. And I think much of that, I, I think resonates in a, in a military serving population. Uh, and I've particularly looked through the lens of what the army is all about. So we are all about our people and it is not about the privilege of people as they join the army, but it's about their talent and getting the most from people and for, for some uh, they might not have been given the same opportunities as others so as a long way of saying I think it started with my mm. upbringing with my parents that laid out a landscape that was there is your opportunity go take it yeah, go see what you can do. yeah. No, great. Um, and then, and then I, think I look at my my career I mean I've I, um, I've been surrounded by inspiring leaders uh, I'm not sure I could pick out individual ones but but more often than not, the reason I have found them inspiring is that I have, I want to be around them. Um, uh, I want to uh, be in their company because I know that they value me uh, and they are very authentic in the way that they come across. Um, and I think they're very active listening listeners. Mm. Uh, so I think 
I could you, you think of a couple of people in particular, just to name people that you've served with, that you respect um, and they've delivered? So I, so I, I generally wouldn't want to label others uh, above um, others. And I, and I think I would make the point that it's not necessarily people that I work for. Yeah. Um, it's most definitely uh, junior NCOs, senior NCOs, warrant officers and officers that I have worked mm. alongside. Uh, yeah. that I think they just value the whole team and are very real to themselves. That's really good. And it was something that we haven't discussed before, but while you talk about valuing the whole team, I'd really be interested in when, when you've been with a collection of soldiers and warrant officers, NCOs and officers, and it's really worked well in a challenging time, you know, goodness, you've been in some, you know, pretty hairy places in the Balkans in Iraq and, 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 and being, uh, projecting force in Latvia um, against the threat that comes from, from Russia. Um, when you were in a good team, what was it? Could you think of that particular team? Could you even mention the team? It doesn't really matter if you don't have to, but what was it about it that made it a great team? And what were the sort of qualities that you pick out make a good team? Uh, we had a very, so I would say regimental command, formation command, uh, and I would say sometimes uh, it's just as important in a staff team. So I would say exactly the same now as being um, director of personnel and sort of the 200 strong team in the army headquarters. It's about having a very clear focus, sense of purpose, understanding what it is that we are striving to deliver. Uh, I think it's about being in each other's minds um, because then you, uh, can anticipate each other and work very cohesively um, as a team and, and then it's about trust. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we're all about people uh, and we're all about the trust of those on our left and our right that um, we know that they're with us and that we've got each other's backs. So I think a common purpose working together cohesively because we are in each other's minds and then trust. That is really good, really good. I love all those three. And Trust seems to be a thing that comes up time and again. And if it's in a coaching scenario where a CEO has got feedback that I've gathered on them, that they, they need to develop their trustworthiness. They need to be more trustable. Um, when you've been in a situation, obviously you can't mention a particular situation, but where there wasn't trust or trust was broken, how did you handle that? You know, what was the impact when there's low trust in an environment you've been in? Um, so I, I think it's about building relationship. Uh, and I can think of times where uh, perhaps trust has not, and maybe neither it, it should be, it's not automatic. Mm. Uh, and it's about building relationship. Mm. Uh, and so much, and I'm not saying this just because I'm the director of personnel, but so much of what makes us tick is about understanding each other and our people and building a very personal relationship. Um, and I think either when trust has broken down or when there is just inherent lack of um, trust, uh, it's a demonstrable action to be visible so that people can see you for who you are, uh, and that is a bit of a warts and all. Um, uh, certainly, I would say it's a bit of a warts and all view. Mm. Uh, personal relationships, because mm. um, that's what makes us tick. I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, we we were talking earlier about uh, warts and all, um, because there's that lovely comment um, that you're an incomplete leader leading a complete team. That you're always work in progress. Never, never the finished thing. Always the, you're always on the journey of becoming an inspiring leader. Never arrived at a destination. But what, what would you share about stories about when you've got it badly wrong, personally? Or, or how often do you think you do get it wrong? Mm -hmm. um, do you ever get it wrong? And, and what did you perhaps tell a story or two? And what did you learn from those situations where you did get it wrong? Uh, so I think I quite possibly get it wrong every day. Um, I would definitely say that I continue to learn every day. Uh, and I mean, my most recent example that uh, I, I touched on be before um, is working in a COVID environment. Uh, I mean, for, for everybody, it has been an in 
incredibly uncomfortable um, journey and very much uncharted territory. But if I just look through the lens of leading my team to continue to support our serving population and their families over a very difficult time. I mean, it's in our DNA that we are extraordinarily driven um, and very focused on purpose and delivering our outputs. And that sometimes that can be at the expense of um, uh, ourselves, looking after ourselves. So my, my, my natural disposition of positive leadership, very driven, very focused, um, I, I, I needed to row back a little bit. I needed to temper my enthusiasm so that we kind of protecting ourselves from ourselves. Mm. Uh, but actually it was different to other operational scenarios where we deploy and, we're, and uh, we have left our families and loved ones in secure um, circumstances. Of course, this was this turned it turned it on it on its head. Uh, so I think my most recent and still learning um, is operating in COVID, where we're dispersed. People are working from home. They're trying to balance looking after their their you know their parents or vulnerable um, members of the family. Got two adolescent teenagers that are probably about to steal the Wi-Fi just at the point they're on a critical meeting with their boss and they're slightly worried about how that's going to go. All of that, I think it just, it's been waves and part of it has been a little bit of a pressure cooker where people have felt like they um, desperately want to deliver their outputs, but it is at the expense of family time and all the rest of it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that is my, my, my most recent lesson, that I need to allow people to switch off from the work, um, to learn to walk past the laptop without just doing another check of your emails because it happens to be there staring at you. Um, and that it's going to be okay to say we're not doing stuff and that I've got their back um, yeah. in doing that. So uh, that's, that is my most recent lesson. Uh, but God blimey, there'll be... Um, there'd be on a daily basis, I suspect, there'd be something I'd look back and go, I could have done that slightly different. Yeah. I could have listened to that a little bit more. Um, and, and the military, that's really great. Uh, thank you, General. And the, the military often, from my days, I don't know what they still do, use after action reviews. At this, mm -hmm. this constantly looking at whether it's gone well, whether it's gone badly, what have we learned, what's worked well, what will make it even better. Uh, are you a great user of-, of Yes, do, yeah. Reviews? Uh, well, yes, and, and sort of lessons, and we do, um, we do sort of uh, readback sessions, or um, uh, we do, um, that's not the terminology we use, but I forget the terminology. Anyway, so where we do uh, um, a snapshot of how well we have delivered against the priorities over the last quarter, and we, and we do um, try and regiment how we do that. Uh, and I do think the military is exceptionally good at it. But what maybe sometimes we're not so good is making sure that we follow that through um, and that we don't forget the lessons that we learned previously. So all that I'm talking about now, about finding the balance of COVID, I mean, ask me in a year's time how much I'm still living in the spirit of that, how much of that did I forget? Um, and it's, and I, you know, it's that, how we make sure that we remain true to some of those lessons, which I think is, um, is potentially a bit more of a challenge. And, and, you know, it's made me think about other times that I know I've driven the team hard to deliver outputs that on reflection, um, I perhaps could have balanced it better. Yeah, yeah no, thank you for that. Yeah. And also I think what's been so useful when you have Zoom calls with people into their homes is you get a snapshot of, you know, I've got a little, um, uh, my stepdaughter's got a... Uh, my son walk in then. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> it's just, it's just, this is the human thing, you know, I get my, we, 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 we're carers 24 seven for my, my mother-in-law who's got Alzheimer's and is not well, she's on the government uh, at risk list. Uh, and, and she'll wander in halfway through the conversation and the remote control doesn't work. And yet, yet I'll, I'll be within a minute. And, uh, or the puppy that belongs to my stepdaughter, which is a beautiful little four month old cockapoo, will come bouncing in and be yapping and barking. And, and it's, it's just, it makes us a bit more human rather than that's the lovely part of it don't you, don't you I think, think so I, think I mean so. I won't say what the meeting was but we we had a meeting just the other week where there was oh, five or six two-star generals on it um on Skype um and uh <laughs> I we all got completely distracted because in the background of one uh we could hear a young puppy 
yapping. So we were then completely distracted with the show is the puppy, show is the puppy. <laughs> I know that's not um, perhaps what you would anticipate, but doesn't that show that we are actually all yes. Yes. just a bit more human <laughs> underneath it all? And, um, and this is what we, we were then very focused after that. But for yeah. a moment of time, all we wanted to talk about was the new puppy. It builds trust. It, it undoubtedly builds the humanity and the connection and the humility between people, which I think is so really, really important. Let's, on this light-hearted note, let's look at some other, you know, in times of crisis, when things are all going wrong, the military do have a lovely way, and, and, and businesses do, and we'll come back to the link between military and business and coaching and things like that, but have a lovely way of breaking the terrible strain of weeks, months of working under intense pressure and people perhaps being killed and in war zones with a, with a lovely sense of humour. What, what about people's humour that you've come across in your time in the military? Well, I, I mean, I think it, it, it does come back to the wanting to surround yourself with people that you feel good with. Um, and uh, that is very clearly about trusting them. But, it, but I think it's also about people that can relieve a bit of the pressure uh, and know when to relieve a bit of the pressure. Um, and I am most definitely not a comedian. But in command, uh, I have, um, certainly when I was at regimental command, my mantra was that myself and the command team, the close command team, uh, you know, we had a thing, if we didn't find something that we could have a hearty laugh about on a daily basis, we wouldn't be setting the right tone um, for those that we were um, serving alongside. Um, so, so it wouldn't necessarily be that I was setting the joke, but just to see the light-hearted side in, in stuff. Um, uh, I, I suspect there are occasions where I might have taken that to the extreme. And the uh, example that perhaps I, I shared earlier was that um, as brigade commander in my command team, and you know, the, it was a, it was a entirely male-dominated uh, command team at that point in time uh, that were working under reasonable amount of pressure to continue to deliver their outputs and I had um, decided to bring back an insight from one of my leadership coaching and mentoring um, courses that I had just been on and I think it's probably fair to say they might have got a bit weary of some of these examples but in this particular one I had brought back um, uh, laughter yoga living in the spirit of my if we don't all have a good hearty laugh uh, and it is literally what it sounds like where um, you as a group um, have infectious laughter in a yoga exercise manner that just lightens the mood. Uh, and to their absolute credit, my very male testosterone driven command team uh, lived in the spirit of doing a bit of laughter yoga. I'm not sure they would ever thank me for it and they definitely wouldn't want it on camera. Um, but, but sometimes, uh, what, that, what that was telling me was the importance of just lightening the mode, mood and just finding something funny in adversity, which uh, just means that we enjoy each other's company a bit more. Uh, they have never let me forget the laughter yoga and um, the decos at the time, um, who is now a, a, a so as an infantry lieutenant colonel, um, I don't think he will ever walk past me without breaking out into some form of laughter yoga. <laughs> but I love that because that's a shared experience that we both found very amusing. Yeah. Um, and I guess enjoyed each, each other's company, albeit I might have taken the uh, all have a hearty laugh on a daily basis a bit too far. Yeah, no, I love that. That's a really nice story. So let's, um, we'll, we'll finish everything at the, in about uh, 10 minutes time with, with um, uh, some, some top tips. But before we do that, I'm very interested in your sort of your life journey and uh, on the way what you learned about leadership and where you read about it. And, and I'm also interested in the fact that people can now really connect much more with the military and the terminology you use, personnel and you know, mm -hmm. coaching and a lot of business practice that you're using and goals and targets and watching the money and your budgets. It, it, it's, it's no longer a very different world. It, while it is different worlds, there's a lot of crossover. And you, know, you were talking about you know, some of your training there and the laughter yoga and things like that. But um, tell me a bit about your, your journey from, you know, you, you're talking about growing up in Northumberland in quite a, uh, a happy uh, childhood, you know, walking to school and things like that. But on, on your journey through uh, to the moment that you're at now in your career, just, just tell us a bit of the journey and, and perhaps some of the things you learned about leadership on the way, really. Mm. Uh, 
Well, so I think it 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 started from um, my you know blissfully happily happy childhood, um, where I I don't think I was naturally uh, particularly confident, um, and I definitely had to work hard in order to uh, achieve and to to get on. Um, but I think if I go back to my family laying out opportunity. Uh, that is what I have consistently been given throughout my um, service career. Mm. Um, and of course, I joined an army that certainly if you were to compare that the army 20 plus years ago to now, um, you perhaps wouldn't describe it as heaps of opportunity for, for women. But of course, at every point in my career, I have been very fortunate that the people that I have worked alongside either served for or um, they have served with me. Um, it has been about people that I have felt have got my back mm. and are helping see the opportunity. So I think my biggest lesson has been that enduring, seeking out the opportunities for everyone to deliver uh, and be their very best. Mm. Um, you know, and if I take that to my most recent lesson of working in a COVID environment, of course, that's exactly it again, wasn't it? I needed to create an environment in which people were given the opportunity to know when to say no. Um, so, I mean, charting through all of my service career, I think I have learned from those around me about how to create the feeling of opportunity. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, you still need to earn uh, some of those opportunities, but it's about seeing the opportunities, not the barriers, and where there are barriers, finding a way around them, not being focused on the barrier that's most in front of you. Yeah, and, and in fact, you've just triggered in my mind. I'm reading uh, "Leadership as Language" by Admiral David Marquet, who wrote a very good book called "Turn the Ship Around," which I thoroughly recommend for turning an organisation around. And as a, a submariner he found that he was used to being the answer man in charge of the 135 people on the submarine. And he said he had to learn to put a masking tape over it and actually say, this is my intent. What's your intent? You know, this is what I need to get them to think for themselves. But one of the things that stuck in my mind, he said, give information, not instruction. Now I know every imagined the, the military just go, just do this. This is my command. But actually the reality of what your experience is very different. So if you sort of say to people, you know, be back at 10.30, they all rail against it. They don't want to follow that instruction. But if you say, I'm starting again at 10.30, they all know they can make a decision. They can live with the consequences. I just wondered if you found whether you've used sort of information rather than instruction in, in a more staff oriented environment, where just giving the old, the old idea that people are just bossy as the military, just tell people what to do. They don't do that, do they? It's very different, really. No, no, but I think so much of it comes down to our language. Um, and um, uh, and I and I'm not sure I, I would ever have described myself in in a very directed or directive authoritarian style, um, but sometimes I suspect others would have said, mm, "Yes, you are." Uh, but it comes down to the language, uh, and of course we work in an extraordinarily hierarchical um, organisation, which we know at times is absolutely fundamental, but we also know at times is a real constraint to our ability to really um, empower people to, uh, to contribute in the way that they would most want to. So in a way, it's about the language that we use in a leadership role and a particular moment in time. Mm. Certainly as I'm working in a army headquarters, in a strategic headquarters, uh, you know, it is very much the language of not, I need an answer to, it's to encourage and it's this coaching piece about how um, actually we want to empower others, a much more diverse team than what you might expect to see in a military headquarters, so that they all have a voice. Um, but you have to, again, you have to encourage that, I think, through the use of language, which um, is not always straightforward, uh, but I think that's where it comes down to. And yeah. I think your information rather than, um, uh, you know, so that you live in the spirit of an intent. 
yeah, I, I think it's really good. And, and it is interesting how, you know, General Paul Nansen has got a few months left in the army uh, looking after recruiting and training, but he has got himself a degree and qualified as an executive coach like me, and we're going to work together, I'm sure. Um, but I think leaders like yourself, when your time comes to an end within the military, you've got such experience and knowledge to share that actually if you could also coach and mentor, it's a great skill that you bring into business and being able to cope with a crisis and emergency planning. So, so you went away and, and got yourself qualified, didn't you, as in some coaching skills, is that right? So, so I didn't do any, so I'm not qualified, but we have as a director, we've done, um, so we did a bit of a reset where we tried to uh, really turn it on its head in how we operate. So try and remove some of the hierarchy in the structure that would prevent um, people feeling empowered, that meant that we did better shared situational and awareness and that we were, as an executive leadership team, we weren't being directive and it wasn't hierarchical staffing, but it was about how the executive team could look over the horizon and provide a bit of guidance and coaching mm. to our team, people in yeah. our team, rather than it being what you would probably expect to see in the, um, in the army headquarters. But I think that comes back to your point, from the outside looking in, we probably do seem uh, a very traditional uh, hierarchical organisation, um, an institute that uh, perhaps is not as dynamic as the reality that you find inside the organisation, where we're all about the people in the organisation, we're all about people realising their true potential and mm. are seeking the opportunity to be less structured and hierarchical. Which brings us nicely on to uh, in the discussion with Paul. Paul got to meet my wife, Lee, who uh, I'd love you to um, have a session with her at some stage because she runs the charity the Inspiring Leadership Trust, which is for vulnerable girls, normally aged about 16 to any sort of ages, really. But, but they've been through some horrendous experiences. It might be modern day slavery, trafficking, abuse. And, and as you've seen, the, the amount of abuse that's gone up during lockdown has, mm. has um, gone up by 25 to 50 percent but also mental health issues but but giving these girls the opportunity to go from education into experiences in employment and and get them launched in life when they've had some really bad knocks oh. mm. um, and, and I think it's really important that when people look at the military they see there's really equal opportunities and indeed you know you're a role model now you've broken the ceiling in various different ways for young girls to come into the military and they want more women in the army as particularly all ranks but particularly as officers to be role models so looking back you got a I think an army cadetship you went to edinburgh and then you joined the army but what about parents now who are listening to this and thinking oh, i wonder if i should encourage my 17 18 year old daughter to think about an army career or people might be listening to this thinking should i join the army What's it, what's it like now for people to, to join if you're a woman and you want to join the army? You know, what are the opportunities like? Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, the, um, the change in the army in my uh, lifetime, uh, I mean, is, is profound. I mean, they're almost not comparable. Um, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the journey that the armed forces have been on to be uh, where we are today. Um, I mean, I, I guess my, my first thing would be uh, just look at what the organisation uh, represents. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm really proud of being the Director of Personnel is because what the Army stands for, what we deliver, what, what we provide to national UK resilience is all about the people in the organisation. Um, and that is extraordinarily rewarding. So for somebody who might be looking for that sort of rewarding, challenging career uh, with true meaning that delivers something for the nation, uh, you know, first stop, look at the military. I think particularly then for young people that are looking for an opportunity the one that they can seek out where to invest in themselves. So that could be literally skills and transferable skills, whether that's on apprenticeships or whatever, tangible skills, or actually in their own personal development, you know, their own personal command and leadership. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, very specifically for uh, young women that 
might seek a career in um, the armed forces. Uh, I mean, there is no role that you cannot do. Um, and your career path is mapped by your talent and it's not about your gender. Um, and actually, a lot of the work that we have done to drive inclusive leadership in the military, uh, I think, speaks to just how much we seek to have a diverse workforce because we realise um, just how operationally important that is. Mm. Uh, so I think that's what I would say. And I would definitely say go and have a look. I mean, even if I look through the lens of my eldest son who uh, flip flacks about whether he wants to join the army or not, but of course he's got two parents that have um, served. Uh, and he, I guess he was a typical uh, adolescent, liked his sport, wasn't at least but interested in academics and was a, a little bit of a flippity gibbet, but he joined the cadets. Uh, and in the space of literally weeks in a cadet environment, he had more confidence. He spoke really proudly of his achievements. He went away and did some of the preparation, not all the time, but some of the preparation in order to get his promotion. Mm. Um, and that is in a really short period of time on a part-time basis um, as a cadet. And if you just look at what that delivers to a young person, um, I mean, it is truly fantastic what opportunities are given to our young people. But, you know, translate that to full-time service. Um, uh, and I you know, go and have a look, I think, and just understand some of those opportunities to your young people. Fantastic. Well, look, our, our time is sadly coming to a close. And um, before we go, I, I'd love, you had some, one of, we were discussing earlier, some, some top tips that you'd leave with people. People who are listening, who are in business, uh, early in their career, mid-leadership roles, maybe CEOs themselves, what practical tips would you share that, that have served you and the people that you know that you'd pass on for nothing to others? Uh, well, so for what they're worth, um, because they're not particularly strategic, but the, um, the three that I always remind myself of is the first one is to feel comfortable in my own skin. Um, there've been lots of times, I think, during my service career where I have not felt comfortable in my own skin. Uh, and I think, um, you are so much more true to yourself and authentic when you feel comfortable about just you for being you and um, not trying to be anything else. I think my second one is to see others, see yourself as others see you. Um, and I, and that, that really comes back to, to my point of being an active listener um, and be sure to then act on what you're hearing. Um, but sometimes just to reframe and see yourself as others see you. And then my third, third one, I think, which uh, and I'm definitely a latecomer to this one, is about the role modelling and reaching out. Um, the importance of uh, demonstrating uh, opportunity, um, I think, is really important. And of course, sometimes, at a moment in time, the difference could be made by reaching out. But I'd wrap that all in and enjoy it all the time. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, Major General Sharon A. Smith, thank you very much indeed. It was really exciting having you on the on the program and i look forward to staying in touch but thank you for all your contributions thanks good to chat bye for now